Hey everyone out there in the live stream, thank you so much for being here. If you have comments, thoughts, please put them into the live chat and I'll try to make it part of the show. If you're watching later, thanks for here. Oh, hold on. Hold on. There's a super echo. There we go. Yeah. Does anyone, uh, 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 anyone in the meeting have the 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 YouTube stream open, or is there something wrong with the Streamyard? One moment, maybe it's me. Uh, Actually, that brings up a good question. Do you want us to be muted when we're not talking? No, it's it's okay. I just it's okay. this has never happened before with the the thing. It's like I hear my own. Is it is it better now? It's weird because I don't hear. I don't hear it either. Wrong. Wow. Okay. I did That's see good. in Zencaster you could turn on or off an option to hear your own voice. I don't know if that's a thing that could do the echo. All right, hold on. Let me just uh, hang tight. <laughs> the highly scientific turn it off and turn it on again. Yes. Yes. <laughs> hopefully, that hopefully it's going to work. <laughs> uh, yeah, I think. Can you say something? Me? No. Hi. Yeah. Okay, good. Uh, I was afraid it's from my setup, but I think it's okay. I think we're good. So now we are alone and we can, I don't know, are, are we live? I don't know. <laughs> it seems like Probably. What happened. Here's what's happened, everyone. Sorry, sorry about that. We're about to get going. So on my other account, a different account on my computer I'm logged into, I had the YouTube video open because I was copying the URL and it started playing, but not on my account. On another, I, there was no windows I had. Anyway, all right. <laughs> no, it's a ghost. It was. <laughs> I'm like, sure it's was really bizarre. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, hello, everyone out there. Thanks for, for being here in the live stream. So, all right. Let's now that I've, I've I've dispelled the ghost. Thank you. Uh, we'll, we'll get we'll get started. Leah, Yarek, Axel, welcome to Talk Python. Me, it's good to have you all here. Thanks for having us. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. It's it's really fun to be talking about Airflow. These are the types of tools that I think they don't get that much awareness, but they're the kind of thing that can be the real backbone of a, a lot of a lot of teams, a lot of organizations and so on. So I think that'll be super fun to dive into and we'll all learn a lot. And I suspect a lot of people listening will realize, oh, here's a, a whole class of tools I didn't even realize I should have considered to solve my problems. But before we get down to that, let's start with your stories. Leah, you go first. Uh, how do you get into programming Python? Oh, man. Okay. So let's see. Python was the first language that I learned. I do have a bachelor's in computer science and at the school I went to, that is the language that intro to CS is taught in. Um, I am so jealous. My intro to CS class was in uh, Scheme, which is a derivative of Lisp, which didn't seem that practical. And then I was told I had to learn Fortran. It would be the most useful language I'd ever learn, neither of which turned out to be true. I wish I learned Python. I mean, I, I got lucky. Uh, so th <laughs> thanks, Carleton College, Northfield, Minnesota, uh, for giving me Python early. Um, and yeah, so I, I loved Python from the beginning. You asked how I got into programming. So I actually do have a parent in tech. It is my dad. And he tried to get me into programming a lot earlier. And like a true teen, I said, absolutely not, because it was suggested by my dad. It really wasn't until I got to school. And I heard people say that intro to CS was a fun elective. Uh, <laughs> those only listening, that's uh, totally in quotes as I'm saying it, uh, that I decided to take it. And I turned out I really liked it. And I decided to pivot from being a math major, which wasn't going very well, uh, to being a computer science major. Oh, that's fantastic. I was also yeah. a math major. And I find the programming side, a lot of the same skill set you have to use, like the thinking yeah. through problem solving, you have these constraints or axioms in math and you like work from them. But in math, you just come up with sort of like the next idea that is the next problem that is the next idea. And in computers, you build stuff that people use. And exactly. it's, it's such a difference, I find. 
it's puzzles is the programming. And that was always the part of math that I liked. I never liked the writing proofs or the theoretical side of things. I just wanted to solve puzzles with logic and rules. Yeah, fantastic. Well, it sounds like you landed in the right spot. That's awesome. I, I'm doing okay. <laughs> <laughs> Yorick, how about you? So, programming uh, Python. You, yes, you talked about your first language. So my first language in computer science in, in, during the studies was, I think, Delphi or Pascal, I can't even remember that. But actually the first language I started programming in the real work was, listen to that, COBOL. So if you've, uh, if, so I, I tend to joke that uh, when I'm retiring, I will be very well paid f five hours a week programmer of COBOL because nobody right. else will know it. You're going to keep uh, but, the trucks delivering and the, the warehouse is open and just, yeah, exactly. Yeah, beautiful. So It'll be on retainer five, from five the hours a week. Yeah, that's that's super cool <laughs> job, I think. Uh, but but then Python is actually quite new in my uh, in my portfolio, let's say, of languages. I've learned it maybe six years ago uh, and with my experience and years of uh, of, of working in CS, it's 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 relatively uh, late, uh, but I loved it from the first uh, first glance. Uh, the, I, I used to work in like C, in Java, C++, uh, hundreds of other, or no, no, a lot of other languages, but Python was just super easy from the start and super nice to, and super, super friendly. Like yeah. I was, after years of programming in Java, I was like so much, oh, in one line you can do what I would do in five pages yeah. of Java. Yeah, yeah. That's and cool. you can understand it as <laughs> well. Yes, yes. <laughs> so yeah, that's, uh, I fell in love immediately. And uh, oh, fantastic. And this is my, my absolutely uh, favorite language right now. Yeah, same, same here. Caxel? Yeah, for me, um, I did my bachelor's in electrical engineering, so um, didn't do anything over there. But when I came in the UK to do my master's, uh, we were taught our language and uh, Java. Mm -hmm. um, one fine day, we were ending the college in just a month or two, and um, there was a presentation from someone uh, in the university who, who was telling us how to use data science in the industry and everything. They said, you should know Python. And you're like, oh, but we were not taught Python. <laughs> and we are just one or two months away from doing our internships and everything, and we don't know Python. So that's when I started looking into Python. I got an internship, um, and then I actually started learning more of a Python. So this was 2016, I'm talking about. Um, and yeah, since then, it has been a wild, wild ride. Um, I have written a lot of Java, a lot of R but Python seems to be very easy to write, easy to understand, plus the community behind it and the packages behind it are so vast that you can use it for anything. Basically. Yeah. yeah, I saw a funny t-shirt once that said, I learned Python, it was a great weekend, <laughs> which I think is really funny, right? <laughs> because on one hand, yeah, sure, you can go through, and actually the language is simple, especially if you know something else that's like Java or C++, you know, this, is a, this is a breath of fresh air, right? But on the other hand, you know, I've been doing this for a long time, all day, every day, and I'm still learning Python every day, right? So it's it's this really interesting juxtaposition of like you can learn the language really easily, but then there's the standard library, and then there's 300,000 PyPI packages. Like Airflow is just one of them, and that's our whole topic yeah. today, right? So it's it's this it's kind of both, right? Yeah, well, and the language keeps growing, so you got to keep track of uh, the cool new things that are released and things that are true in Python 2.7 are definitely <laughs> not true today with Python like 3.10. It's grown yeah, a lot. Yeah, it definitely has, and I, I saw that Airflow is uh, not supporting the older versions of Python uh, basically as they get deprecated, so cool. yay for that, right? Yeah, we have we've actually have you know very very strong rules following the Python uh, release rules. So we've learned from what Python learned on the release schedule, and we we just follow it very very closely. Uh, with yeah. Like how much we uh, when we support when we stop we support. Yeah, yeah that, difficult that to maintain awesome. compatibility between Python two and three. That's a lot of overhead. Um, we, uh, the, actually, I, we, I, yes. I, I have nightmares about it, cherry picking all the stuff from the main branch to the old release branch and but, adding Python to support. <laughs> but Caxil, Caxil, you cannot complain. I mean, we both, but Caxil did that a lot. And 
thanks to that, we've been uh, several times top committers on Apache uh, organization. Like there is a like this week most commit uh, most commits made, and that that was us doing cherry picks between the three version and two seven version. And once we made it both at the same time top committers on on Apache. I, I, I'm I'm mad at GitHub. The GitHub does not count. Um, commits on any other branch except main or master. <laughs> oh, <laughs> not fair, not fair. <laughs> we'll have to do our own visualizations. Eric. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> all right, before we move on out the live stream, Hawaii Girl says Python is awesome, uh, like all of us. Yes, definitely. Thanks thanks for being here. All right, well, let's, let's start this at a, a slightly higher conversation than just Airflow. So Airflow is one of these workflow management frameworks like whoever wants to take this wh what is that why do i need that when do i need that wh what are these tools as i hinted at the beginning yeah so i want to walk through some of the history though like in 2014 2015 where like data engineering was not mainstream and everyone was just using um cron for scheduling their task and then there came Luigi, uh, where people were yeah. using XML and those sort of languages to write their DAGs workflows um, to make sure that the task runs on schedule. And yeah, so DAGs directed acyclic graphs. Yeah. Yes. The okay. DAGs, yeah. Let's be very clear. You cannot have a circle for tasks. The dependencies cannot be that. People have tried that. Um, and. It and, takes a long time to finish those. Yes, <laughs> a long time. Some of some of those legs are still running. So <laughs> it takes a long time for them to start sometimes too. <laughs> um, but yeah, I think uh, to complete the history part, uh, people just got bored writing uh, the XML syntax, and it's it's difficult to understand. Similar to what we were talking about Java and Python, like Python is much easier to read, easier to understand. There came Airflow, uh, Maxim, uh, who wrote Airflow in his time at Airbnb and open sourced it to Apache Software Foundation. And that had a sigh of relief for people working on Luigi and others as well, because then you could write your workflows in an easy to understand language that you're already very familiar with. You don't need to write those XMLs and who 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 loves writing XMLs first of all, <laughs> uh, and so it's easy to understand. Just configuration as code, and there was also like I think a, a slight move towards everything as code, infrastructure as code with Terraform and Ansible and whatnot. And Air, Airflow was just a perfect tool for workflow as code or DAGs as code, uh, and. Since I think 2016 to 2018, Airflow's popularity has skyrocketed with the advent of like separate specialized data engineering field. Uh, previously, yeah. I think software engineers used to do everything, um, but then people or companies also realized that it's a separate field. It's a lot of work. It's not, you can also just not include machine learning engineer and let him do everything. It's a separate data engineer's job to write a pipeline, knows how to handle the data and everything from start to scratch, retries that thousands of things, uh, which your, first of all, your cron expressions or cron alone cannot handle those, uh, the task dependencies, the SLAs and whatnot. So I think that's when with the advent of data engineering, people realizing the importance of data, airflows popularity gained uh, massively between 2018, which also, by the way, coincided with where uh, Airflow became the top level project in Apache Software Foundation. Until then, Airflow was just an incubating project in ASF, and then yeah. it became a top level project. And that was yeah. a big milestone for Airflow and the community. I think data engineering is really interesting because a lot of people, when they think of, well, what are the divisions of what you do with programming, you know, especially in Python? Well, we've got like web programming. Some to some degree UI programming, um, and then we've got data science. So sort of web and data science are the two, but there's this middle ground where I feel like people kind of don't want to go there, or that's the data, right? You want to make sure, you know, if if you get a bunch of data and you feed it to your model, your model is only as good as the data you get, 
right? If you're trying to automate some ingest of data or warehousing reporting, it's only as good as the, the reliability of the data coming in, the accuracy, right? We've got things, uh, was it great expectations and stuff like that for testing, actually testing against the data, not the code that works with the data. Yes, and yeah. uh, let, let me just add, because also, Airflow is, is really an orchestrator. So like I, I used to sing in the choir for many years. And for me, this is really like this, this parallel between the conductor and the team playing. So we, we don't do stuff in Airflow. Airflow doesn't do stuff. It's, it just tells others what to do. And this data processing stuff. Uh, so like we don't know how, basically we, we as data engineers, uh, because like we are actually, you know, data software engineers writing things for data engineers. So uh, when we think about like this cross of this both like software engineer and data engineer, so we don't know how to actually make a model, machine learning model, or you, yeah. we don't know machine learning. We don't know how to, even we don't know how to do map reduce. I, I mean, if you want to process a lot of data, but we, we know what to do with the data when it comes, who should do next what and what how, how to pass it somewhere else. And we can make it super complex to uh, define or complex in terms of uh, composed on many, many different stuff, steps in different relations, but, but Airflow makes it super easy to manage the whole thing so that it runs smoothly and you can operate it and you don't, and you can deal with any problems that, uh, that arise on the, on the go. Yeah. So, Yara, at this point, I want to expand on it real quick. It, there's a very human aspect to the workflow orchestration that I think both you, both Kaxel and Yark have touched on, which is that having a workflow orchestrator really enables you to move from having like the data scientist in their silo working on this pipeline alone to having a whole team of data scientists and data engineers working together because you have really specialized folks who can work on building those models. And that might not be the same group of people that's figuring out how to get the data from A to B and making sure that it's healthy and is what the model and the data scientists are expecting. Um, so I think it just enables a lot more collaboration and helps you have more specialists working together. Yeah, it becomes that, that well-known, well-tested way to flow data. Yeah down into the, the specialties that people need, right? Exactly. Uh, so one of the things you do in these types of frameworks is you build these tasks, right? Give us an idea of what some of the tasks look like. And you actually have a, a whole bunch of, would that be the integrations in there or is that something different? Provisors, that's yeah. the name that we are using in Airflow okay. too. Yes, so we have like more than 70 of those right now. We did for 70 services we talk to, external services or uh, data by, the databases or whatnot, uh, 70 entities. But within that, we have several hundreds uh, of these so-called operators uh, or sensors uh, or transfer operators, which perform the task and they are actually super easy. It's just one method, execute, that's it. Right. That's pretty right. much it. It's so, like... Yeah, there's those, the three things, the sensors, the operators, the transfers, like an example of a sensor might be waiting to see if an object is in S3 or in Google Cloud Storage. Um, and a transfer is moving something from A to B and an operator, those are the ones we probably have the most of, right, Yarok and Caxel? Yep. And that, it can be anything in a service. Uh, I don't know, like starting running. So I work in Google Cloud, so the operators I'm most familiar with are the Google ones. So like spinning up a data proc cluster and then running a Spark job on it or um, running something on a Kubernetes pod. There, yeah, if, if you can dream it, either there is an operator for it or you can write an operator for it. Yeah. Yeah. When I started with Airflow um, back in 2017, we used Airflow for the same reason. Like Airflow was designed for for a, being a classic ETL tool or being an enabler of sorts. So a lot of companies were migrating from on-premises to cloud. Uh, we were doing a project with uh, in partnership with Google to move a customer's data to cloud. And we were using NiFi uh, for data to be on GCS. But from there, everything was 
uh, orchestrated by Airflow. So once the data lands in Google Cloud Storage, then there's classic ETL that extract, transform, load from GCS, it goes to BigQuery, BigQuery does some manipulations and the they, uh, data goes to like uh, there's a dashboard a data studio that shows a, a rich dashboard behind it and this is all managed by uh, airflow and it was so easy because we separated this using task and we were using all the hooks and operators that leah and yarek was talking uh, were talking about which was like gcs to gcs operator move the data from the uh, landing area to staging so your landing area remains untouched so you can verify with your vendor that the data is as they sent uh, even in futures and then there were big query operator to run sql query and then there are another other operators for different gcs mm -hmm. services so i think with google there was already good amount of integrations back three four years back um, similarly for spark and uh, other operators yeah one of the things that stands out to me that might be really useful here is if something goes wrong, you know, you talked about the contrast being cron jobs or something like that. And if something goes wrong with that, or you need to scale out across different machines or whatever, and how do you get those timings right or other uh, weird things? So what's the, the mechanism for dealing with, you know, I'm going to get some data, it drops in the cloud, I'm going to pull it over, but then maybe it's invalid data or something. What's the, that look like? So at least for Airflow, all the operators that were written previously or the idea behind them was that the task, a single operator or a single task should be idempotent. So even if you run them multiple times, it should produce the same result. So if a task for whatever reason fails, you could add more retries to it. There's a retry parameter that the base class takes and you could say retries is four, retries is five and Airflow will handle that for you. So if a task fails, it will rerun it for that amount right. of time. It could fail because the database server's down or it could fail because it's never going to work, right? It could be either one, huh? Exactly. And you want to be notified as well. So then we had all those uh, on failure callback, on success callback, those emails get sent out saying the data didn't arrive at all or whatever the reason may be. And, sure. and there is there is even more to that because we also have the mechanism of backfilling the data. So even in this case, it's not like not a server failure, but your data has improved because it, it's got, got a new you got a new metadata and you want to reprocess the data you've already processed for like last week, or only process part of the data because it's uh, you know it takes a lot of time and you you know that the data up to certain point is good. Uh, but then you have to process just a part of your workflow, of, of part of your DAG for the last week. You can do that with Airflow. So you can just tell, uh, make a comment, run a comment, just reprocess me that data for this period for, uh, of time, uh, starting from this task, because this is this is where we know we have to reprocess the data because it, it, the, the data has been cleaned up, for example. Right, you don't have to detect it, you don't have to copy it down, you've changed it locally and you want it to get no. fixed, I see, and, okay. And the super cool thing there is that this can be done by one person who doesn't know what those tasks are doing at all. Like they are just uh, all the kind of language of how the tasks are written. The, the specification is written in the way that anyone can do that. And then the, this person operating can very safely just rerun parts of it and be sure that what comes out at the end is just what they are expecting. And if you have like hundreds and thousands of DAGs written by you know tens and twenties or hundreds of people, uh, just one person can sit down and operate all the whole the whole of it without understanding a single thing how it works inside. But yeah. with knowing, with seeing what happens, this is this is this is like so powerful. Yeah, uh, part of Airflow. It lets you focus on just the steps and not how they fit together, right? Yeah. So yeah, uh, let's let's focus on a couple things on the website here that I think are maybe worth calling out. Uh, Leah, one of the things here is that the project has that, four principles mm -hmm. that are are really nice. Maybe you want to highlight those for people. Yeah, um, I think, my, okay, so the four principles, it's that Airflow is dynamic, extensible, elegant, and scalable. And I am going to go ahead and pick my favorite one right here. And it's one that we've kind of touched upon without spelling it out clearly, which is that Airflow is extensible. Yark talked about how we have these 70 plus providers, these various integrations with all kinds of services from the big cloud providers to 
things like Slack, Snowflake, which I know are also kind of big, to much smaller ones. And if, uh, an, if a provider doesn't exist or if an operator doesn't exist for a, sta uh, for a task that you need to perform, you can write it and you can either write it and be running it in your instance of Airflow, or if you're being a good steward of open source, you can write it and contribute it back to the community so other people who need to do that task can also benefit from what you've already figured out. Yeah, that, that's really neat. So a lot of these would be uh, things like uh, down here, like if you know only yes. one person has to write, how do I connect to Hadoop? Or this is right. if you go to, uh, Airflow.apache.org. You can go to the bottom. There's, there's all these different. Uh, are these the operators or what are these, or the tasks? Those are yes. those are integrations. Integrations, let's say, okay. uh, integrations with the different services you have in. Uh, so like Google, for example, is a big provider, but it consists of integration like Google Cloud, Key MS, Data, data Store, Machine Learning. So you have a number of, right. of integrations per provider, even sometimes. Yeah. Okay. Cool. And Leah, when these are. Um, when you, if I was going to create one of these, if I was going to be a good citizen and like, oh, I, I want to create uh, one with AWS Lambda, that exists, but you know, something like that, right? Yeah. Does that get contributed back to Airflow? So when I pip install Airflow, does that come with it? Or is there some external way to bring in? Yes. So um, we do actually, well, I'll have to double check with Yarek and Caxel because I know we've been messing around with how we do the installs lately. So it used to be that um, Airflow operators were packaged along with Airflow. And when you did pip install Airflow, you would get everything. And I think that you do still get a certain number of base operators um, that are kind of like provider agnostic that come with Airflow. But the way we have things now is that all of these provider based operator sensors um, all these operator or all these provider task things are packaged separately and you add them just like you would any other kind of Python package. So for example, oh, yeah. if you want to install the Google cloud operators, you have that separately. And the advantage of that is that um, they're released on a separate release schedule um, and follow versioning that ensures they're compatible with versions of Airflow. And they're very clear about that. Um, and it's, a lot easier for Airflow users to upgrade just the provider's package than it is to upgrade the entirety of Airflow, which for folks running in production, that is not always feasible or practical. Yeah, you can actually click on documentation link on this page, uh, Michael, and then you will see uh, all of the, all of those providers. So you see the, the oh, yeah, there they are. provider packages. And you can see the documentation of that versions, the different versions. We we release them very frequently. Like every month, we have a bunch of providers released, which are adding new functionality. And they are done completely separately, as Le Leah said, or, or, or com not, not, not the same release schedule of, as Airflow, and you can start using them, 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 them faster. And this is, this is actually super cool that you can actually always find something there. But if you don't, we don't actually force you to go this community route. Like those are all providers which are developed by community and maintained by the community of Apache Airflow under the Apache Software Foundation rules, which is called like Apache way. So the way how Apache releases software. But if you want, you can actually build your own custom provider. You can, you can build your own custom operators and you can release them separately and somebody can install that. And they even we even have integration points that if people are writing the custom providers, they can use exactly the same feature as the community driven ones. And, and you can install them as a package, as another Python package, completely independent from Airflow. And it just you know plugs in the UI of Airflow, plugs in into the, uh, the whole framework and you can start using it. So it's, it's both yeah, community fantastic. and custom. Yeah, you can go either path, right? That's neat. I think, Leah, what you're saying about the the cadence, the release frequency, and maybe even the degree of seriousness with which you have to apply to these, you might want the main airflow to be treated differently than you know yes. some edge edge package or integration, right? Yes, definitely. Yeah, um, there. There was a, a proposal for requests, the very popular ACP library, to be integrated into Python to replace Python's HTTP layer. 
And the decision of the core devs, I believe, was we don't want to do that to requests. Like it will actually make requests go much slower and only get released once a year with changes rather than, you know, as quickly as it needs to go. Same thing for you all, right? That was one of the biggest reasons for us to separate the providers because when we were releasing 1.10.2, 1.10.3, 1.10.4, it meant that all the development was happening in the main or master branch. And we were not releasing from master branch because we were just releasing the minor or patch versions right now. And because the code has to be tested thoroughly, uh, even if there's a small bug in one of the providers, let's say a Google GCS bucket operator or something, it has to wait until the entire code has been tested and released. So the cycle can be large. Whereas what everyone was thinking, at least the committers and PMC members, that providers can be released more frequently, even if it means it can be released. Uh, if we find a bug right now, we should fix it, go with the normal ASF um, releasing way, which is like three days of voting and release it. So it is quicker release rather than waiting for the next month to club it into the core airflow release. Plus that way it's easier to also check the changes that happens because imagine checking the change log for 70 odd providers, including the airflow core in a single page. It's a, it, it will be a nightmare. Yeah. yeah I don't I just miss that. Yeah, I bet. I just think of all the coordination of, well, there's some people working on the Discord uh, integration and someone's working on the Samba integration and we're going to do a new release. You've got to kind of feature freeze all that stuff. So yeah, oh, yeah. It, it makes a ton of sense yeah. to separate. Yeah, actually, thing. actually, this is this is super, super cool that, you know, I'm under release manager for providers uh, so far. So I was releasing, I don't know, maybe six, seven, seven releases over the last uh, year. And uh, and actually, I do it myself in like two, three hours. I'm able, able to uh, like bring all the changes and put the release notes for all the 70 providers. It's all fully automated and we can manage and release that without a worry that it will break something. Because if one of those releases goes wrong, uh, go, uh, providers go wrong, we can simply yank, yank this release. This is this fantastic feature of, of PyPy. We can yank the release. And this actually happened yesterday. So we discovered that the PostgreSQL we released uh, to one zero version had an incompatibility bug with previous version of Airflow. We haven't discovered that during our testing. We test a lot of things, but this one slipped through. But what we've done, just yanked this release. Ev anyone can use the previous one. When they install Airflow and Postgres operators, they will install the latest version. And in the meantime, we can just fix the Postgres SQL and release a new version. And that's uh, that's super cool, actually, for for maintenance release and uh, and usability and and, and stability of uh, of your installation. Yeah, uh, that's really good that you can change that around. All right, so I want to talk about first of all, let's let's talk about installing. So what is, you know, how do I get Airflow onto my computer? It depends on if you want a hosted managed version like Cloud okay. Composer, <laughs> which I work on, or there is one for Amazon MWAA, and there's also Astronomer, which is where Caxel works, um, yeah, yeah. or if you want to do it yourself. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. In, in general, though, we um, at least say that use the constraints uh, constraints file. So every time when we release an Airflow version, we also uh, tag in GitHub the constraints file for each of the release. A constraints file contains the set of known dependencies that we have tested it or uh, tested Airflow with on the CI because Airflow has a lot of um, dependencies. And last be, before before we started using constraints. There were a lot of instances where we just released Airflow and then one of the dependencies released a breaking change in a minor or a patch version, which means users couldn't install Airflow. Uh, and to get over it, we came up with this idea of using constraints file because Airflow is a library as well as an application. So for library users would want the latest versions, whereas for application, you want the stable versions of everything. So we came up with this balance of using the constraints file. So if you check that uh, that Airflow version 2.1.2, we get the Python version and then we fetch that constraints file from GitHub and use that constraint file because that way we can guarantee that the, uh, it is reproducible and it will work for sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah, very yeah. cool. So if I go to the documentation, there's a couple of options. I can run it locally. I can run it in Docker. I can run yeah. it in um, Astronomer. 
But looking through the, the script to set things up here, it looks like there's a couple of steps. So there's a database that does something. <laughs> there's some users who execute the task or, you know, you don't want to run as root, most likely. I suspect that's something you all discourage <laughs> probably. Yeah. Well, so, and there's a web server and there's a scheduler. So you, uh, who, who want, maybe tell us about that, whoever wants to take yeah, it. So, 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 so I'll, I'll take it. So Airflow is, is, is pretty complex uh, in, in setup because it has multiple components. Depending on the setup, you can talk to a Kubernetes cluster, you can execute a workflow there, or you can have Celery queue system processing your tasks and executing them on, on distributed workers because the the scalability part which was one of those uh, features of airflow so you can you can have multiple uh, uh workers multiple machines and um, even several hundreds of them if you want and airflow can be installed using using all all those capacity so so we have salary workers we have kubernetes worker we have scheduler we have web server and putting it together is not as simple as uh, as you would think, uh, or actually you can think that it's complex, and it is. Uh, however, we've made a, like recently, especially we've put a lot of effort to make the kind of very simple way of installing Airflow. Like you know, like you just just install it and it works. And also, if you want to scale it to like a very complex one, you can also. Turn, turn on all the knobs, put as many components you want in a, in a way that he, that fits you best. So uh, coming back a little bit to this installation management, we have a Docker image. So that's something I, I also worked for, for quite some time uh, together with Caxil and the other maintainers, we iterated and perfected it. So we have a very nice Docker image that can be used to both run Airflow as it is, or build your own custom image, which contains all the new dependencies you want, or all the special uh, packages that you want to install, which are needed for you. And then from that, we have Docker Compose, which is a kind of a quick start. So you can just, and, and this is this running Airflow in, in Docker. Uh, this you know, when, you, when you run in Docker, does say the web server run in one container and the scheduler in another or something like that? That's exactly what this. And then compose orchestrates it. Yeah. Okay. Yes. And but it's super easy. Like it's 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 really a quick start. So you just you you just download the Docker Compose file. You just run few two commands. If you go a little bit down, then there's like few commands to run, and then uh, off you go. You have all these components talking together to each other and processing the DAGs, and you can start playing with that. It's not production ready, the Docker one. Uh, but then there is the next step. So like, so you have a, a local installation, you have the Docker Compose, and then, and I will, I will, uh, I will transfer it to Kaxi because he was working mostly on that. So yeah. So we also have the, the Helm chart that we uh, the first version of Helm chart we released in March of this year. So that's what we recommend for production uses. Um, that uses the official Docker image. So we released like a lot of our artifacts for um, Airflow. And again, the documentation for Helm chart, if you click on documentation uh, again at the top and scroll all the way down, you will see a separate documentation. All for right, the Helm so go chart. to Helm chart. Yeah, okay, got yes. it. Yeah, um, so we have version all this documentation separately because they are different artifacts and all of them have different release cadence and are released separately. Uh, and Helm chart is what we recommend for users because it comes with all the configurations that we have tested it in production environments. Uh, Astronomer donated the Helm chart last year and we iterated on it a lot of time uh, before we released it. Um, we also, me and Jarek uh, had uh, gave a presentation in a recently concluded Airflow Summit. So if users are interested in it, uh, we can probably drop a link uh, at the end of, end of this session, I guess. Uh, yeah, you all just had the Airflow Summit, right? Yes. Yep. Yeah. Yes. Oh, mm. I have a lot to say about this. Um, All right. Well, yeah. I, tell us. Yeah. Community is definitely where the majority of my contributions to Airflow come in. So this was our second ever uh, Airflow Summit. Uh, so far, it's been an annual thing, but I'm always nervous to say annual because I don't want to make 
promises, but I, it's looking good. Like we'll have it again. So we had our first summit in 2020. We had originally planned to have it be this 500 person in-person event. It was going to be in Mountain View. That's how I got involved because mm -hmm. uh, we were looking to host it at the Computer History Museum. And I said, oh, that's really close to where I work. I can like be your liaison to the location. And then, you know, there's a whole pandemic and everything. And we ended up pivoting to a totally virtual event. Uh, and it was a great success. We did it um, in partnership with Software Guru. They helped us run the summit last year. And we uh, felt that it was such a good success that we did it again this year. And it just finished up uh, in July. We had 10,000, I think more than 10,000 at this point, registered attendees from That's all really over the That's really good world. for an online conference. Uh, for only the second edition too. We're, we're pretty proud. Yeah. Um, and we had it live streamed in a bunch of different time zones. So sometimes it was more America's friendly. Sometimes it was more EMEA friendly. Sometimes it was more APAC friendly. And we had all variations of talks. We had ones that were customer use cases. So people who are running Airflow in production or running one of the hosted managed versions of Airflow um, and what they're using it for. We had people who are contributors talking about their first time contribution experience and why you shouldn't be scared to contribute to Airflow because we're really nice, I promise we are, um, or at least we try to be. Um, and we had more experienced contributors like Yark and Caxel talk about some of the more complex things that they've been working on over the past year and everything in between. Um, and I, there are so many talks and uh, you have the, the summit page up right now, actually all of the recordings and slides for those presentations that had slides available are uh, up there for you to watch. If you go to airflowsummit.org, uh, there's many, many, many hours of content. I highly encourage you to watch uh, whatever sounds interesting for you. Yeah, I think this is great. I'm Like I said, congratulations on having 10,000 registered. Thank you. That's, yeah, Thank that's you. pretty amazing. I think there's a obviously a big group of people who know that this is like the right tool. I think there's a lot of people who necessarily don't know for sure. Like for example, there's on the Airflow GitHub page, it's 23,000 stars. That's, that's mm -hmm. big time. Yeah. Django yeah. and Flask are 50, 50 K. So, I mean, that's, that's a lot of uh, people using this and interested in this and so on. Yeah, I my think the best part about Airflow is the community. And that's like why we have, those stars, but also like why we had such a summit. And Caxel, you were going to say something, so I'll turn Yeah, I was just going to say that uh, if you go by the PyPy stats, uh, we have like 3 million downloads a month or something like that, uh, which is insane. I know a good number of those come from CI and automated processes, but hey, all, all the other packages also have the same thing. So you can at least compare them between packages. Um, yeah, it's a relative like, statement at least, right? Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> and likely I mentioned like uh, the biggest part about or big, greatest thing about Airflow is its community. Uh, if you check the new contributors, I think we are more than 1600 contributors to the Airflow project, wow. uh, which is great. And every day we at least get few new contributors trying to contribute to the project with whatever whatever they can and they must and I again uh, through your medium I would encourage people to go to Airflow website if you find anything contribute it fix it if you have some ideas about hooks operators anything contribute it and we are there to help you uh, not only uh, three of us there are more than 30 40 um, committers and PMC members, and there are users helping users in the Airflow Slack channel. We have more than 16, 17,000 um, members in the Airflow Slack workspace as well. Wow, that's cool. So I actually want to give a quick plug for an Airflow Summit talk I gave this year um, that was authored by me and a colleague. It's called, You Don't Have to Wait for Someone to Fix It For You. Um, and it is about the kinds of contributions that you can make to Airflow, because there's all those things that Caxel mentioned, but my personal opinion is that one of the best and easiest ways to contribute to Airflow or any open source project really is to find something that is driving you nuts. 
and to exactly. fix it, or at least to articulate really well what's driving you nuts and what needs to change. Because a really good issue can be just as good of a contribution as a PR, because you may have just right. like made the foundation for someone else to write a fabulous PR with a really detailed issue. Yeah, and uh, let me add to that as well because I like com the community is definitely the the thing that I, I love most about mm -hmm. Airflow. Is like the people uh, are are fantastic here, and we are all of us, uh, all the committers. We are so much into, you know, uh, making mo like inviting people to come and to to join us and or to give back for whatever they uh they got from airflow like it's a free software anyone can use it for free so giving back is just super nice uh but we don't stop talking only talking about them because if you see if you scroll, if you see scroll down a little bit above you you would see that we also uh run a workshop uh during the uh, oh, yeah. the airflow summit and this workshop is about contributing to apache airflow and this year we had like 20 attendees coming and learning in three hours how to make your first PR, how to communicate, how to be present in the community, how to make the most of it, how to be super helpful to others as well. And then we were we were just it was it was like part of it was about coding, but all the rest was all about communication, about speaking to people, about you know being able yeah. to express yourself and all the stuff that we just needed. And it, who, who should I ask? about this and things like I that. I know exactly who you should ask. <laughs> so actually one of our one of my favorite stories about this year's Airflow Summit is we had a speaker, um, I forget her last name, her first name is Tatiana and she's like a principal data engineer at the BBC right. and she went to the workshop last year. And this right. year she was a speaker at the summit and her talk about um, how to basically like how to debug when crazy stuff is going wrong in Airflow was fabulous. Oh, Absolutely. super. Okay. Yeah. And uh, you can, that's, people can live stream that off the sessions. That's really mm -hmm. cool. Clearing yeah. airflow, airflow obstructions. Awesome. So that is an example of that workshop working. Yeah. Yeah. Very cool. I, I feel I, like, airflow, go ahead, Axel. Yeah. I was just saying Airflow Summit is also one of a kind conference. It's not like the normal conferences, mainly because we had, Air, the local meetup groups hosting that day of the event. So we had like the London meetup group, we had the Bangalore meetup group, Melbourne, Warsaw meetup group, and every, though we were bringing the community together. So let's say the first day was hosted by the London meetup group, which was me, Ash, and other folks. We were hosting um, that event for just for the Monday slot. And then on the Tuesday, there were uh, other PMC members, other community members from Japan hosting that, some from Melbourne hosting that. Similarly, those were the slots. Um, and someday even we had like some sort of overlap because we were trying to cover the Pacific time zone and the Asian time zones, uh, which was incredible because now you have tons of content for the Airflow users to watch out. Also, we had two community days. We started from Thursdays. So we had Thursday, all the talks about community, how you could make the contributions and stuff like that. Friday, we had that workshop. And then from Monday to Friday, there were more about the Airflow use cases and uh, why Airflow 2.0 was the big milestone for the project and what we are planning ahead for uh, Airflow and, and the stuff like that. Oh, yeah, that's there's a ton of stuff here, I think people could watch for the rest of the year and study this and get a lot out <laughs> of it. It's true. <laughs> I, I do think and, so. And we actually even had a networking event there uh, Friday night. And that was a blast, actually. I, I, was fun. Uh, the networking this year was like people learn how to use it online. And 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 it, that was like, well, not maybe as good as good as uh, physical conferences. So I'm looking forward to next year, which Hopefully, we're going to be partially at least a physical event, but it yeah. was good enough. And uh, I, I think uh, that was really cool to talk about to, to the, those people about all the different things, not only Airflow. So we are not only you know Airflow and not only Python and not not only programming, but also people. Yeah, I feel like this is a project that would be easy to contribute to in the sense that if I'm going to say contribute as a newcomer to Django. That's going to be hard because that's a highly polished single piece of software. And if you're going to make a change, that affects millions of people and it's not easy. Whereas here, if you want to add some kind of integration and it didn't exist before, you're not going to break anybody's code. You don't want to work with a bunch of legacy code. There's a bunch of 
sort of broad but shallow places people could jump in and participate. Yeah. Well, and if people, if a newcomer does want to come in and like really jump into the deep end, we do have this um, concept called uh, AIP, which stands for Airflow Improvement Proposal. And it, it kind of sets you up to not run run into heartbreak if you open this, what you think is an amazing PR and we're like, oh, no, 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 hold on. We're yeah. not ready for that. Because <laughs> it's, it's almost like writing that outline before you write your essay. I know it sounds kind of dry, but what it really is, is it's an opportunity to fully flesh out this amazing idea you have and share it with the community. And the community will give you feedback and they will be productive about it because if they're not, they're not abiding by community code of conduct. Yeah, um, I, I find it very um, unfortunate. I feel really bad if people uh, come and do a PR to some project that I have. And granted, these are all very small open source projects. But if they come and they they actually do the work and the first I know about it is, boom, here's a PR. Yeah. You know, that is not in the, that's just not in the same zen of what i'm trying to accomplish with this and it's gonna it's gonna break the thing that makes it special so i it's have to reject it right but you don't want to it would yeah. be much better to say i have this idea if i built this would you want it you know do you want yes. the puppy not here's a puppy for christmas yes yeah, this, exactly this, this is this is precisely what we are uh, teaching people at those those workshops because it's it's not obvious if you if you come yeah. from outside you don't understand that so we we no. we're not only teaching people about uh, contributing the code but also how to find yourself there like how to be empathetic how to think about the, put yourself in our shoes and on the other hand how to you know tell what you want to tell in the way that yeah. we will understand it yeah because it's sometimes uh, really different worlds different people different backgrounds different expectations and assumptions so so all this is the communication is that i think you know like i'm i'm a, I'm a software engineer I, I love to do software engineering uh but like mm, 30 40 50 percent of my time is communication it's not not yeah. not actually coding coding this is and this is cool uh, i related to this i actually want to call out a really important apache value that i think that airflow embodies which is the concept of the importance of community over code and i really feel that the airflow project lives uh, lives that value um and but real, folks in the community really are trying to foster a positive community because they understand that if the Airflow community is not healthy, then the Airflow code will not live on. It, it doesn't matter. Yeah, yeah, it doesn't matter. Um, and if folks have questions about that, uh, I, I do want to acknowledge that uh, I am the, the one woman in the room. I am often the one woman, woman in the room when it comes to airflow. And I would love to see that change and have more gender diverse folks come join. And so if you are someone who identifies with that and wants to hear Leah's unfiltered views on the community, feel free to reach out to me in the airflow Slack. Yeah, that's um, fantastic. Yeah. Twitter. Yeah. And like I said, I do think this is a project that if you want to get into open source, it's one that has relatively low barriers, technically speaking. Yes. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, I, the keynote talk I gave in the Airflow Summit uh, on Thursday, the first talk. So if you go to the Airflow Summit page, the very first talk, where I talk about my journey as well, because I was very afraid of contributing to open source because it feels intimidating at first on like... Yes. Everything will be public. Oh, who knows if I screw something up? What would yes. people say? So be on my permanent record. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so I, I, and I didn't know Python or didn't know it proficiently. So I, I talk about my journey of how I did it. Uh, talk about 10 minutes about that and then how a new user can start contributing to the project. Because Airflow is a relatively still a larger code base and there are a lot of areas that people can target because if you try to learn everything at once, it is going to be very difficult. So we have Helm charts, we have Docker images, we have scheduler, the, which is core to Airflow. We have executors, we have the CLI, REST API and a lot of things like that. So there are a lot of room for people to get expertise in a certain area. And then if you start including all the integrations, then it's a whole beast, right? You can just yeah. add your own integration and be an expert at that and become a contributor, committer, PMC member, just with that contributions. 
Well, and in the interest of empathy, um, I would like to share that I do not know all of these parts. Uh, I think the part I'm most familiar with is the Google provider, and I have never touched the Helm chart, and it scares me because I haven't taken the time to learn what it's all about. Um, but the good news is that community members, other community members know, and I know that I can look to them for help when I do need to mess around with it. Yeah, yeah, that's, and that's the beauty of the project, right? If everyone yeah. knows everything, then why are we all here? Um, yeah. Each one of us knows their part, then that's the community. Otherwise, it's not Our a community team. project. Yeah. 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 Yes. Uh, we're getting short on time. I do want to touch on a couple of things that I think yes. we haven't got a chance to touch on that are, are really important. Um, one... Yeah, one, let's, let's talk about the user interface because yeah. one of the ways you all position to this is you don't want to do this all with just cron jobs and and like sort of little scripts that are put together and ran run on weird random triggers and one of the real big benefits is you have this really beautiful ui for all sorts of visualization of like running workflows and all kinds of stuff right you want to tell us about that uh I'll, can I, i'll do the the simple version because i think that Caxel and yark know more about it than me but i'll tell you the two things i'm most excited about one of them is that it just got a huge makeover with Airflow 2. So if you're an Airflow user and you haven't upgraded to Airflow 2, if you need one reason alone, it is that the UI is so much prettier and it is much more responsive. Um, and as a former cron user, I'll say that the, the best, easiest benefit you get from this is you can just see what's failing. If you don't have to dig around and try to figure out what's missing, like you know that something went wrong. All right, Yarak and Caxel, that's my, I'm off my soapbox now. Yeah, basically you have all the information you need, all the historical view in front of you. Like if you want to see which task failed historically, you could just check the tree view and then this is the graph view where you can see how your task is proceeding. Plus we now have auto refresh, like Leah mentioned from 2.0, which is like, you don't need to press the refresh button, which was a bit annoying for the Airflow 110X version, which is very good. Your task will continue. You can see the progress that the Airflow is currently running this task. If you click on that task, it will uh, show you the logs of that task. So everything is very Fantastic. intuitive um, and easy yeah, and for, to monitor. For people who are listening and are not watching the live stream, there you can go and for example, in the graph, it'll show you all your tasks that you would do, like download this file or run this bash script or whatever. And then it actually shows you how they're working together. And then they're colored as you progress through this DAG of tasks, right? So you can actually visually see, was this one skipped? Was this one successful? Which one failed? How far are you visually as a graph, which I think is awesome. Yeah, and one of the no. interesting thing over there is to understand the dependencies, uh, which was very interesting when I initially started with Airflow, that for, for a user or for a company to understand what all the tasks they are working on and in a single flow, how does that dependency graph work on? If you are depending on a data from a single client, how does that go to a dashboard? So that end-to-end -end view, like, you, it's an actual pipeline of sorts that you can see. <laughs> Yes, and and just to add on that, so the, the visualization of the data flow is like super important because you, then you can, uh, with a glance, you can see what's going on, and you can you can uh, go to any part of it and and uh, focus on that and and understand what's going on. However, uh, I will come back to uh, kind of the roots because uh, uh, Airflow is not uh, w doesn't have a way by default to define those uh, flows visually. You can mm -hmm. see them visually, but they are all defined as Python code. And this is like the beauty of it. And that was a very, very deliberate choice. Uh, choice. And this is like the reason why we are at the Python talks today, because mm -hmm. Airflow is all about Python. Uh, so this, this visualization that you see here are really reflection of the of the code that you wrote as a, as a writer. And it means also that the common language between people uh, uh, using Airflow, uh, different parts of it, is Python. And this is this is the common language that we are using, and and this is so makes it so powerful. Uh, and the visual part is is pretty much an addition, and, and it's necessary, but it's more kind of result of the of the Python code which is being written. And, A lot of workflow this, systems try to go in reverse, right? They're like, here's your draggy droppy set of tasks and options. You drag it all together, then you press go. Right. This and, this and lets you know, at this, the code this all level. breaks. This all yeah. breaks at the very moment when you want to have to some custom custom work. Because if you are used yeah. to do the drag and dropping 
you will not do coding. You will not code the, uh, the kind of custom customization that you want to do. You will ask someone else to do that. In Airflow, this is quite reverse. I mean, everything is Python. Everything. Uh, dependencies are Python. The code itself is Python. The blocks are Python. But you can also write your own. In the same place where you define your DAG, you can write your own custom operator uh, without having to use a black box operator of sorts. And you don't have to leave the box of working on Python uh, while doing that. And this is so powerful, I think. This is the way how why it is so popular between data engineers uh, all over the world. I think it's like one of the most popular uh, workflow orchestration engine in the world right now. Uh, I wouldn't... I, I, I think that that's that's it. I don't have hard data on that, so you know, like it's 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 yeah. just a feeling. But I think it's that's the case. I mean, yeah, and we while did have four thousand every... people at the summit, Yark. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, for sure. And, and while it is written in Python, you can use the Bash operator to run like your Java code, for example, or Scala or whatever. So uh, while everything is in Python, you can use it to run any other languages too. Yeah, you've got. Oh, you you've can... got... Yeah, go ahead, you, can run, you, can, you can run Docker image, Kubernetes tasks. Because a yeah. lot of those workflows are also, OK, we have Kubernetes. So we run everything in Kubernetes. We run them as Docker containers. And that's the only way you can do that. Airflow can do that as well. No problem whatsoever. There, are, there is Kubernetes pod operator. You can spin off a, a new Kubernetes pod to run your tasks. But you can also have a Python code, which is very easy to like put together and play with and run locally without all the overhead of building the Docker images and, and making the, them available to run you as a task. It, it's so, so much more extensible and powerful in this way. Yeah, that's a, a very good point. There's a lot of escape hatches to bring in other technologies. That's cool. Yeah. Let me give people just a super quick sense of what it's like to write code for this, this Python code. So you would say with DAG, with directed acyclic graph, and you give it some details. And then you create these various tasks, like a, a task might be a bash operator or something like that, or like you said, a Kubernetes pod or whatever. And then you just run them. I, one thing I did want to ask you all about, like. What is what is this T1 double arrows into list of T2, T3 for the task? Is Ooh, good question. So you have those tasks mapped to variables called T1, T2, and T3. And this is how that visualization is defined using I those see. like the, the bit shift operators in Ooh. Python. So this one would say that um, T2 and T3 run after T1. Interesting. And they run yeah. in parallel. And there are different ways of setting dependency. If you scroll down or just search for setting up dependencies mm -hmm. on the right, right side of your, um, on, the, on the right side, yeah, setting up dependencies. Yeah, there you go. There are different ways you can set those dependencies between tasks. You could do T1 I got you. or T1. You can dot like setup. right shift, you can left shift, you can double mm -hmm. bit shift as a transitive type thing and set upstream. Exactly. <laughs> and, okay. And, and, and the beauty of that, again, is that you can. Uh, this is all Python code. So those those are custom operators. The right shift, the left shift, and right shift—they are just custom Python operators uh, overridden. Right, and you can override them in the in the task, right? Just like pathlib overrides forward slash to mean like combine oh. parts of the path, right? We wouldn't probably recommend that if you don't know <laughs> Airflow that much. But the, the the better thing there is that you can actually programmatically build the tasks and build the relationships. So this is not something that is predefined in, the, in one file in the declarative way, like it is an XML file or JSON. So this is a Python code. So you can pretty much dynamically build the DAG. So very complex, like we, we saw like, you know, the DAGs which were like thousands, thousands of nodes built with like 200 lines of code. Because you could build those tasks, uh, you know what which relationships you want right. to build. In it's what it's way. very hard to have a conditional in a JSON file or oh, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, that's that's the <laughs> yeah. thing. Or loop, actually, loop in JSON file is like no. I mean, yeah. there is no way to do that. I mean, we do have XSLT. You can go crazy. <laughs> yeah. Come on. Oh, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Please no. <laughs> and also, the, from Airflow two dot oh and up, uh, onwards. This is an uh, explicit way of setting dependencies, but from Airflow 2 and onwards, there's also an implicit way of having dependencies, which is like, if you say that your bash operator takes an input from another task, then Airflow uh, sets uh, dependencies between them implicitly because you are depending on an output of an, uh, another task, so it knows. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. 
Cool. All right. So I think just two really quick things before we, we wrap it up because uh, we are short on time here. One is uh, we talked about the the web UI for the stuff we're looking at, but there's also, you will describe a rich command line utility to make, to perform complex surgeries on DAGs. Okay. What, why would you perform a surgery on one of these things? And what is this all about? Mm. <laughs> Who wants to take that one? <laughs> uh, I don't know that I've done surgery with the CLI, uh, <laughs> but I have used the CLI to give me information about my environment to figure out when things are misbehaving. Yeah. Okay. Um, well, like for diagnosis and stuff like that. Yeah, like because we have this one command list DAGs and it also shows you how long the DAGs are taking to load. So you can kind of see if one of them is your problem DAG. If it's taking way longer to load than the rest, that usually means that I've made a mistake. Yeah. Yeah, that command also gives you the parsing time and everything like that. So it yeah. can tell you that it took five seconds to parse your deck file, which means something is wrong in your deck file. You are probably importing a lot of things or doing some database calls on the top of your file, not inside the objects. So you gotcha. could find those sort of issues. Also, you could use Airflow backfill CLI command to run all the backfilling of data if you got the data today and if you want to run it for last one year or so. Yeah, but also it's what is not mentioned uh, in the document. There is this, uh, 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 well, it is mentioned in the documentation. We have also a very, very powerful and rich and very well written API. So we have a stable uh, as of Airflow 2. That was one of the improvements implemented. Uh, so if you go to Apache Airflow, yeah, uh, and scroll down on the left, yes, uh, not, not this one. All, all the way down, yeah. The, the, even below, below, there was like stable REST API. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, gotcha. Okay. Yeah. So, so this API is like written in open API, API standard, uh, which means that all the tools which we can you can you can imagine for like managing access, uh, for trying out things, for testing the API calls, all the beautiful documentation that you see here with examples, this is all automatically generated from our API, and this is this is this is this is super cool because you can actually, and this is this is surprising. You said that the UI is fantastic, and yeah, it is. But there are some companies who have their own UIs, they, their own ways of looking at the processing pipelines. And many, many, we've learned during the Airflow Summit, many of those companies, they actually build their own UI. They don't use Airflow UI at all. They just use right. the engine. They maybe want to integrate it into some larger thing they already have or, or something. Exactly. Yeah. exactly. And this API makes it possible. So you can just query which DAX you have, which are the relationships, yeah. how how this all works, which, which, which is successful, which not. And then you can build beautiful UI uh, or even ugly UI if you want, uh, but the UI that that is is something that you're used to without looking even at the Airflow UI, and this is this is also super powerful part of, of Airflow. Yeah, and, and this is straight a uh, straight up REST API. So yeah. while Python is awesome, if you're not a Python person but you still want to adopt this, like here's a way to integrate with it, right? Absolutely. Exactly. And we have already started creating. Um, clients in different uh, languages, like we have a Java client for uh, Airflow built on this API spec. Uh, and users could use that and uh, users can create their own APIs for specific language because it under the hood uses open API. So you can auto generate um, clients for different languages. Yeah, fantastic. All right, I think that is about time for us. I did want to point out that Astronomer and AWS, but Astronomer, where you work, Axel, is a, a yeah. sponsor. So um, if you want to run sort of uh, Airflow as a service, that's kind of your job, right? 100%. And also, we uh, Astronomer has their own registry. So if you do open registry.astronomer.io, it makes it very easy to search for built-in providers that are baked inside Airflow, or if users create and maintain their own providers, it is very easy to search that as well. Yeah. I just cool. posted the link um, if you just want to check out. Yeah. And, cool. and, and, and and just one 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 comment on that, because we also have Google Cloud Composer. So we have Astronomer, AWS, and Cloud Composer. 
these are like big em embrace of airflow as a service and mm -hmm. for us it's like you can you can choose either you run it on your own you run it using astronomer uh, which have like great expertise in, in, in everything because we have lots of people from astronomer are commuters then there are uh, amazon people then there are google or um, amazon offering and google offering and and you are free to choose whatever you want uh, in like how you want to run airflow yeah. and, and you can move so probably if you decide you need to move yeah yeah the infrastructure the dags yeah. will be the same no matter where you take them you might have to do a few yeah. changes when it comes to like off and making sure your keys are up to date but that's yeah. it cool all right let's wrap this up with uh, a little bit of future looking just whoever has the right visibility in our group here just you know where are things going in the future people are excited about airflow like what what are they what can they look forward to oh there's a really good talk from the airflow summit that's called looking ahead yes. beyond airflow <laughs> 2.0 it is with ash from astronomer and uh Ijamal from google um and i think the, the thing that ash said over and over again is well, there is no roadmap, but we do always have things going on. <laughs> <laughs> no promises. Now. No yeah. promises, but 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 there are lots of buts. So yeah, we we, we pretty much know uh, the the direction we are heading to. So we want uh, Airflow to be the orchestrator you want to use for whatever workflows you want to run. That's it. And uh, there are lots of things like to happen in order to get there because because we are so specialized on one hand on what we are opening up but uh, but we are on the road to really make it easy to accommodate more use cases make it easier to run make it e fast make it faster make it uh, serve those cases which currently are cannot be served because of some reasons historical reasons mainly and this is mm -hmm. this is this is definitely some uh, the direction we are heading to open up to to even more cases without losing the the single focus like we want to be great at scheduling tasks and orchestration. That's it. We don't want to do processing. We don't want to go into this direction. That doesn't make sense for us. We want others to do processing and we will do orchestration the best way it's possible. Yeah. And, the, and the two immediate uh, things that we are already working on and we are almost close to merging it on the main branch is making the airflows schedule more powerful. That will That is, the users will have more power than just like expressing it in cron users will also be able to say run it on the third of the third trading day of the month or something like that like that level of powerful uh timetable we want to provide uh, to the users we call it timetables we have we will have cron timetable we'll have time delta timetable of sorts we are, we are figuring that out but we'll have that plus uh, something called deferred operators um, Leah mentioned about the sensors, which are currently we poke for for the API call and see until it succeeds. Uh, we are going to have a new component called Triggerer that will use Python's async library uh, to use resources in a more optimized manner. Again, instead of polling, you just await for it to happen and then boom, off it goes. Yeah. 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 Okay. Uh, that sounds cool. Yeah, and Fantastic. Just, just, just one comment to this scheduling because those the great examples. So one of the cases we want to serve, there is a real astronomer, not the company, real astronomer using Airflow. <laughs> and he wanted to start DAX when the, there is a sunset and sunrise. And you know, when you are astronomer and planning around uh, around Earth, that's that's a little bit complex. So the, the whole scheduling is gonna be there to implement this astronomer request, basically. Yeah, fantastic. It sounds really useful. All right, well, I think that's it for covering airflow but let's quickly wrap up with um i guess just one of the questions since we're a little bit over time that i usually ask at the end so i'll ask you about your editor yarek if you're going to work on airflow and other stuff what what editor do you use for python uh well i on a daily basis i use uh, intellij uh, uh ultimate uh that, that's my favorite editor however very very frequently my favorite editor is vi I mean, I'm an old type guy, and VI is always when I have to do something yeah. quick, uh, somewhere where I don't have the power, the editor started. VI is there, and I, you know, have it in my like fingers. I know how to quit VI; it's easy. Uh, <laughs> I can learn you. I can teach you. No problem. <laughs> Fantastic! Yeah, I love that joke about uh, random strings. Caxel, for me, it's PyCharm. I love PyCharm. It's debugging. It's going to the source code and those intelligent help it gives away just a big fan of PyCharm. Right on. Oh, yeah. 
Uh, I use a combination of VS Code, and I also have a soft spot for Vim. Okay, um, so very Vim, cool. Vim, if it's going to be fast, uh, VS Code, if it's not. <laughs> yeah, I think we're going to be here for a while. Let's let's get down to it. Yeah. Right on. Well, thank you all for being here. It's been really great. Uh, final call to action. People want to get started either using Airflow or contributing to Airflow. What do you tell them? Oh, I tell them to go to the community page on the Airflow website, and I tell them to sign up for the dev list and to join the Airflow Slack. Yep. Fantastic. All right. Well, thanks again. Thanks for being here. Thank and, you. Uh, thank, thank, you thank you for inviting us. It was a great time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank great. you. Thanks. Bye. Bye.